Greetings and welcome to a special edition, a Saturday edition of Trinity Radio. I'm Jonathan Pritchett and along with me is normally Braxton Hunter. But today we have a special guest, the world's greatest living apologist ever, Eric Hernandez. Hey, thanks for having me in the studio. Yeah, welcome to the show, Eric. And why don't you all tell us if you hear any problems with the mics? Um, we did a check, but you know that's a that's one of our weaknesses. But uh, Jonathan wanted me to throw something up really quickly. Jonathan, here you go. Says Peter Nicholson says Eric won't reach many atheists if he has his aggressive head on, as I've seen in the past. But maybe he has mellowed. We'll see. He has not mellowed. He reaches atheists for a living, and he doesn't only have an aggressive head but he does have an aggressive head when it's necessary and i have uh the same character flaw but we understand (laughs) the arena that we're in when we're dealing with the aggressive atheists that are normally encountered on youtube who like all of us uh especially guys like me and eric are sometimes less aggressive when we're not aggressively contending for our worldviews. So sometimes a little bit of aggression is a good thing. And I think that it reaches the people that respond to that kind of thing. And maybe it does turn some other people off, but it takes all kinds. So, yeah. And uh, so we, we spoke this morning, I was at their uh, church. We did a, a, a session with the leaders. And one of the things we're going through was a passage where Jesus is talking to the Sadducees. And not only was he aggressive, he was snarky and sarcastic with them, making fun of them in public. Yeah. These, these Sadducees who prided themselves on memorizing scripture, he begins his response with, well, you guys have this false view because, well, you just don't know scripture. And then the second response, he goes, well, haven't you, haven't you read? Which, again, he's being sarcastic, publicly making fun of them. So there's definitely room yeah. for aggression. People who literally have memorized the Torah. Yeah, exactly. And he's saying, haven't you, haven't you read the Bible? I mean, don't you know the Bible? Man? So what we're going to do today is Eric is going to walk us through his PowerPoint and talk a little bit about um, how, some things that he thinks are good principles for reaching unbelievers. Uh, before we do that, I want to respond to Kenneth Gee, who I think is a Christian commenter who asked me this on another video and I responded, but maybe you didn't see it, so I'll respond to it here. Uh, respond to it here. What is an apologist? That comes from the Greek word apologia, which means in defense or to defend or in defense of. And all Christians, I believe, are called to be apologists. As you you asked me what I thought before about the office of an apologist, whether I thought there was one, I don't. There is no such thing as an office of an apologist. In Ephesians 4.11, it talks about pastors, teachers, elders, apostles, evangelists, but not... um, Uh, not apologist. So there is no official office of the apologist, but I consider myself to be an evangelist. There is an office of the evangelist. And to me, the best reason to defend Christianity is that people might believe Christianity is true. So an apologist uh, is someone who could build up the faith that way or could reach people for Jesus, which is primarily the way that I'm interested in. So, uh, but yeah, I think that someone should first be uh, something else and then an apologist out of obedience to God or to support some particular thing God has called you to in your life. Right. The, the, the second you are starting to give an answer, you know, uh, you are doing apologetics for why you believe. People have this mistaken idea that giving a defense is what we sometimes term the academic discipline of apologetics. But apologetics is more than just cosmological arguments and resurrection arguments and teleological arguments and all of that. Uh, apologetics is giving a defense for the hope that is is within you. So anytime you give reasons, you're giving a defense. So we are all apologists. Yes, that's what I've said. Stop making it sound like Eric is, Eric is very special. He's my friend. And secondly, if someone is better at something than a lot of people who are trying to learn how to do that and is therefore good at teaching them, then yeah, that's special. And that's a particular type of ministry God has called him to in the realm of discipleship or evangelism. This is, I take it to be a kind of a, um, simple issue. I I don't see the controversy and I certainly don't see the controversy that means we shouldn't do this or something. All right. uh, Let's get, let's, let's stop answering questions for a second. Although if you do have a question, um, you can type question in all caps. I'll try to see it and save it and we'll get to it in just a little while, unless it's super pertinent to what is being discussed at that moment. And I see it and I choose to go ahead and throw it up on the screen and make Eric respond to it. Um, we'll answer those toward the end, but thank you so much for being here. We are so thrilled to have you here. And, uh, Eric, 
let's uh, let's throw up on the screen your PowerPoint here, and I'm gonna back away. I'm gonna decrease that you may increase. And uh, because just kinda, he's special, just, right? Yeah, yeah he is special. because because he is the special guest. Yes. For this episode, anyway. And as I said before, the greatest living apologist of all. Not just our time, of all time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Again, thank which you. is all that matters. Appreciate you guys for having me on. Um, thank you for giving me the uh, lower chair, even though I'm shorter than you. And <laughs> just makes, amplifies the problem. Um, so th this PowerPoint, it, it comes from um, uh, keeping your prayers. I'm in the process of writing a book on witnessing to nonbelievers, and I've put together uh, what, what I call the lazy approach. Uh, it's a lazy approach to evangelism, if you will, and it's really about having better conversations with nonbelievers. Um, so I kind of want to briefly go through these and have some discussions on some of these points. Um, <clears throat> it's it's not Greg Kokel's tactics. I, I, I know Kokel personally. We've talked, and I told him I, I've been doing tactics before I knew what tactics was just because in studying philosophy, you, you pick up and learn about logical fallacies, um, and I've just incorporated these from the beginning, and then, of course, just kind of refine them. But well, let's start off with, with uh, this here. In Colossians chapter 4, 5, and 6, Paul gives us uh, some interesting advice when it comes to ministering to people, and especially non-believers. Uh, he gives a word of advice first and says, conduct yourself with wisdom in your interaction with outsiders. And then he's going to give us two points. He says, make the most of each opportunity, treating it as something precious, and let your speech at all times be gracious and pleasant, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each one. So here are the two tasks. Is basically, he wants you to keep the main thing. The main thing is the overall theme. And the, and the two uh, goals here is, first, you're to make the most use of your time, and then know how to answer everyone. Now, to kind of break these down briefly, um, when you're making the most use of your time, you can think of it as a sort of theological triage. <clears throat> I like to tell people. So like in the medical community, if, if you were a doctor and someone was rushed into the emergency room and there was three wounds they had, um, which would you address first? They have a broken wrist, a scraped knee, and a bullet in their chest. Obviously, you would go for the bullet in the chest because when it comes to triage and medical community, you go for what's the most severe. When it comes to evangelism, we have to keep the main thing the main thing and essentially implement this so we can call it a sort of theological triage. So suppose you had one hour with a non-believer and you knew Christ was coming back in one hour. Here are four topics. Which would you focus on? Uh, age of the earth, creation evolution, biblical inerrancy, or God exists and raised Jesus from the dead. Hopefully the latter, because that is what is essential for salvation, meaning someone can go to heaven and believe in one of these other beliefs and have the wrong belief about the other, but they'll find this out in heaven. So in other words, let's, uh, to keep it brief, let's not make unnecessary stumbling blocks when witnessing to people, because there is a difference between salvation and discipleship. If someone's not saved, for the most part, if you have limited time to keep the first principle in mind, make the most use of your time, you want to go for what's most important in, in order of priority. Um, when we look at the second one, without going into too much detail, Paul is always specific with his choice of words, and he says know how to answer one as opposed to what to answer. So, ex for example, if I were to ask, have you stopped beating your wife, yes or no, there's obviously more than one answer to these two answers to, to respond with. You don't have to just say yes or no. You can say, well, wait a minute. Why would you assume I beat my wife? In other words, with these types of questions, it's more important to know how to answer this kind of a loaded question as opposed to what to answer. There's, there's no script when it comes to talking with non-believers, and I, I personally don't like when people try to present, like, here's a method and here's like a script. Every conversation is different. Every person is different. So here, I want to briefly go over some uh, tools and tactics uh, for what I call the lazy approach. <clears throat> so first, you want to well, go ahead, real yeah, quick, please. yeah, uh, on on this lazy approach, kind of unpack what you mean by the word lazy, so that yeah, you don't, great. yeah. You know. So I'm Hispanic. I'm not lazy. <laughs> I, I, I used to cut grass for many years, um, but basically, it's it's yeah, lean into the stereotype, there, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, um, it, it's it's just a it, it's something kind of tongue in cheek to convey a minimalist approach. Uh, in other words. When I'm in a conversation, and you'll see it in the examples, um, I'm not going to do the work when I'm not supposed to be doing the hard work or the leg work. So first, uh, the first tool is like using questions, and you can use questions to make a point or to gather information to set up a response that you're getting at. So now here's where I do borrow from Coco because I just think he said it best. You know, what do you mean by that, or how did you come to that conclusion? But using this tactic, you can also use, the, use this to reword a person's position when you're talking to them. First and foremost, when you're gathering information, 
using questions to understand them, first you want to clarify that you actually understand their position. Now this is, first we want to be honest with people and we want to take them seriously. So you don't want to mischaracterize a person's position. If, if you think this is what they're saying, rather than assume, go ahead and ask to gain clarity. But at the same time, you can also, by gaining clarity, implicitly make a point, or this could actually serve as a response. So here's an example. Without going to the example of Jesus too much, you know, he uses a question to make a point. Um, <clears throat> I, was once, I once spoke at a, a secular college campus on the topic of abortion, and one student approached me and he said, look, I'm, I'm pro-life and I'm against abortion, but if we, if we don't keep abortion legal, then women might harm themselves seeking illegal abortions. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to reword his position with a question to make sure I understand him, but it's also going to serve as an implicit point, according to him. So I said, let me, let me see if I understand you correctly. Are you telling me that if we don't allow women to legally kill their unborn children, they might harm themselves when illegally trying to kill their unborn children? Is that what you're asking me? And his response was, well, that's a good point. To which I said, well, I haven't made a point. I'm just making sure I understand your position. Um, now, in replying to him, I said, but let me go ahead and try to make a point. And again, I'm, I'm going to use a question and I'm going to take his position and reword it. And I'm going to apply it to a different principle. The, the mentality being that if you're going to deny this principle in a different scenario, then you shouldn't accept it for the one you're offering. So I said, let's suppose I showed you statistics that demonstrated how people, how burglars were getting injured breaking into homes. You know, this guy here, he cut his arm breaking into the window. This guy got bit by a dog. This guy broke his ankle jumping the fence. So if we legalize burglary, then these burglars won't be harmed when breaking into homes. Do you accept that as a valid argument? His response was no, because they're just trying to hurt someone else, to which I said exactly. In other words, he made the point for me, and all I did was ask questions. Um, so when I'm engaging with non-believers, uh, I often it's really important to listen to what they say, and then you can take what they say because it's fair play. You're not assuming. If they're giving you information, you use that. So one, one young lady said, I'm an atheist, and I can only believe things that are backed up by evidence. And so I asked, and what evidence do you have for the belief that God does not exist? Now, here's where the lazy approach comes in, if you will. <clears throat> her response was this. Her first response was, well, the Bible's full of contradictions. Again, theological triage. Uh, at this point, most Christians like to jump in and begin trying to defend biblical inerrancy. But lazy approach in mind. She said, her response to what evidence do you have for believing there's no God, she said, the Bible's full of contradictions. My response was, and how does that prove there's no God? And she looked at me like a deer caught in the headlights. In other words, I didn't respond to her attack. All I did was reapply the burden of proof because it's her claim. Um, so I said, okay, let me, let me put it this way. If God exists, would he have existed prior to the Bible being written? And she says, well, I don't believe in God. I said, I understand that. But if he did exist, would he exist prior to the Bible being written? She said, well, yeah, if he exists. I said, okay, great. So how does a Bible full of contradictions make him disappear or stop existing? What am I missing? So, again, I'm not doing the work. She hasn't made an argument. She's made an assertion. All I'm going to do is ask questions and reapply the burden of proof. And, uh, and I want to say this, that I probably should have said up front. The expectation when you're witnessing to someone, I think we, we talked about this earlier, Jonathan, um, it's, it, not everyone's going to drop to their knees immediately in one conversation. Maybe not in two, three, maybe not in ten. But what you want to do is at the very least give something, someone to think about. Uh, put a pebble in their shoe, as Coco puts it. Um, give them something to think about that's going to um, get them to think about the worldview and the very arguments that you're giving. So um, this one, after we, I don't know if you want to comment on anything I said there. Well, yeah, because the whole point here is I know in so many conversations that that, and, and we get caught up in this, you know, in in the online space, but even in uh, dialogues that we have in person, Christians always think that they're the ones that have to answer all the questions and bear the burden of proof. But atheists do make claims. And one of the things I see, and not just debates between Christians and non-Christians, or Christ even in Christians against other Christians on theological issues, what you see is one person is always trying to put the other on the defensive with questions. And it is usually, like, say, Calvinists and non-Calvinists. And... One of the things that you need to do is recognize that everyone in the conversation, if they have a position, even if it is their lack theism position, 
are still making claims about the nature of reality, if only about their beliefs about the nature of reality, which is still, do you have beliefs that you have good reasons for and you want to know why they have their reasons for their, their lack of beliefs even, even if they're not making the strong claim that there is no God. So they, they still have beliefs, and those they're making claims about the reality of their beliefs, so they need to support those claims. Don't ever feel like you're the only person with the burden, because that is the myth that atheists try to peddle. Because the same with, same with uh, a lot of people in theological debates, they think that their position is the starting ground, is the neutral, and you're the one making the... the the claims that, that have a burden over a, against what they think is the, the starting point for everybody. And that's not true. So Great points. Let me jump in real quick for some housekeeping stuff. Um, I know that you all don't hear me quite as well, maybe, as you're hearing the rest of them. But in any case, um, I just want to say real quick that if you would like to support what we're doing here, our, what makes our channel more unique, I guess, not totally unique, is that we not only think that apologetics is super cool and interesting and worldview discussions are fun and uh, understanding the Bible in a greater way is important for the believer, but we also want to see people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We think what's the point in defending Christianity but that people might believe Christianity is true. And uh, that doesn't mean that it's just for evangelism. It's also for building up your own faith and that sort of thing and thinking more clearly. But um, evangelism is what's on my heart and Jonathan's heart and I know on Eric's heart as well. That's the reason for this episode. If you like to support what we're doing, you can do that at patreon.com slash Trinity Radio. There's a link in the description for this video. And uh, another thing I like to say is we love Eric. If you like the kind of content that he uh, is giving you here uh, and his debates and things, I encourage you to also down to the, go down there. And I think I've got his channel linked and you can go and uh, subscribe um, if that's the content you're interested in. But thanks, everyone, so much for, for being here. We're not done yet. Um, we're just kind of getting started here. But uh just wanted to jump in. So, uh, Eric, continue if you like. Yeah, let's go back to those slides here. Um, so, the next the next tool uh, within my la what I call the lazy approach is is first understanding the distinction between a refutation and a rebuttal. And within the lazy approach, I, I put an emphasis on rebuttal. So let's first unpack what that is. A ref in a, when you provide a refutation to a claim, you are attempting to prove that the other person's conclusion is false. Whereas when you're providing a rebuttal to a claim, you're simply showing that the other person has not proven that their conclusion is true. So we could say that in a refutation, you attack the conclusion to show it's false. In a, refu in, a, in a refutation, in a rebuttal, you attack the justification for the conclusion to show they haven't proved they're right. So here's the example I like to use just to kind of demonstrate the point. <clears throat> here's a claim. It will rain today because I'm wearing brown shoes. Now, if we were to draw a square around the conclusion, it would be... it. It will rain today, and the justification for this conclusion, you could circle and say, it is, I am wearing brown shoes. Now, here's what a refutation to this claim would sound like. Uh, no, it's not going to rain because of temperature, moisture, and pressure in the atmosphere is not sufficient to provide rain. But note, this takes a lot more background knowledge about the, the topic in question, and when it comes to something like this, you may not have the relevant, relevant knowledge, much less at your fingertips in a conversation to provide a refutation making a refutation virtually impossible. But remember, with a rebuttal, you don't need background knowledge of all this, this whole topic. You just need knowledge of their justification, which they just gave you. So a rebuttal would sound like this. Well, no, not necessarily, because you wore brown shoes yesterday, and they did not rain. In other words, I'm conceding it might rain, but your justification for this conclusion isn't sufficient to prove you're right. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying you haven't proven you're right, and the burden of proof is still on you. Um, so... With this, again, this just there's various ways to implement it. We can go into discussions more about it later. The, the next one is more of a, a, a tool of discernment, where you need neither a refutation nor rebuttal. And here's where I see a lot of, uh, even some apologists today, seem to not grasp this or maybe miss it, uh, you know, in the heat of the moment, so to speak. Um, this one is, is neither giving, you're, you're not necessarily responding. Why? Because when a person doesn't give you an actual argument or objection, you don't need to offer response, rebuttal, or refutation. Uh, this is usually occurs when people merely make a declarative statement, assert a claim, or they're just passionately expressing their emotion about your position, which, again, is not an argument or objection. So here's an yeah. example. Well, go, I'll, go ahead. before you get to the example, I'll say one of the things that, that we try to popularize here on YouTube, uh, or, or in Trinity Radio at least, with the Paul, Paul just need to get into the habit of saying, so what? Right? That's another mm. way to not offer a, 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 a 
rebuttal or a refutation because somebody will make a claim like uh, I think uh, the guy who says that you're aggressive and you don't you're never going to reach atheists even though that's what you do for a living but you know he's making dropping claims like uh, the god of scripture I could never want the salvation of the god of okay so what what does right. that have to do with anything yeah. you know a lot of people make it's it's like the the Yahweh is just a tribal war god from yeah awesome so what? That, he's, he, that's cool, you know? Warrior. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, I'm sorry if you're effeminate and that kind of thing bothers you. <laughs> it's God's toxic masculinity hey, is, real quick, is offensive. Before, we, you know? before we go on, I know you all can't hear me too well. That's why I'm shouting on this mic. That is Jonathan's mic that he's super proud of, but it's not great. But works um, great on my own channel. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so just wanted to say that true ID apologetics, which is... <laughs> Adam Jonathan, Coleman! Our, A man. our favorite person. Well, along with several other people, yeah. Uh, but in any case, well, no, <laughs> I mean, he who? says Eric Cornette is for president. Yes, oh, and thank everyone you. go subscribe to True ID Apologetics and become a patron for True ID. Adam Coleman is the second greatest living apologist of all time. <laughs> all right, carry on. Oh, you need the PowerPoint. Yeah. <clears throat> so no, here's an example of this. Braxton so. is the the white Adam Coleman. That's what I'll say. <laughs> So let's say someone says Christians are hypocrites, and I'm using relatively easy examples just to make the point. So someone says Christians are hypocrites. Here's three responses ranking from the laziest to the less lazy, only requiring a modicum amount of more work. So Christians are hypocrites. One response. Go on. And just stay silent. Uh, I, I like to stay silent a lot of times when I when I respond to these kind of things because there's nothing for me to respond to. I am I am letting the other person know you haven't given an objection or argument. I'm asking you to keep going. Um, or someone, you know, again, Christians are hypocrites. Another response, sure, some are, but how would this prove there's no God? Right, so are Walmart shoppers. So what? <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, uh, so what, what Jonathan was saying earlier, the, the third, requiring a little bit more work, sure, and some atheists are hypocrites too. So what? What's your point? Um, this, this was something similar. I was talking to <clears throat> a non-believer once and he said that his biggest objection to belief in God was evil and suffering. Now, um, I said, okay, you know, go, go ahead and explain that for me. Like articulate the objection. He says, well, God is all loving and there's so much evil and suffering. And I said, go on. And he says, well, God exists and is all loving. Yes. And evil and suffering exists. Yes. And I just paused. And he says, well, that, uh, go on. Now, not that I'm not, I'm not, it's not me not taking it seriously. Of course, we want to take it seriously, as, as our good friend Cameron Bertuzzi uh, uh, tells us, we take it seriously. And what I'm doing here, though, is not, not dodging anything. I'm asking him to articulate the objection because I cannot respond to something that is not given an objection. At one point, he even said, well, you know what I'm trying to say. And I said, I think I do. But if this is, according to you, your biggest objection to belief in God, I need to hear an argument so I know how to respond to it. And so far, you haven't given me one. I mean, you might as well say, grass is green, therefore the sky shouldn't be blue. That's an assertion, not an argument. And I want to hear uh, what, I, I want to hear the argument so I know how to respond. I'm not refusing to respond. There's just nothing for me to respond to so far. So that's when, uh, again, neither, neither refutation nor rebuttal. And then the last one, <clears throat> is uh, identi identifying logical fallacies. Th these are like quick and easy rebuttals, if you will. Uh, logical fallacy is an error in logic or reason. So here, you know, you've heard the first one. I'm sure if you've read any book on apologetics or watched a two-minute video, someone says there's no truth. Is that true? Because this is a self-defeating claim. Um, you can't tell people they're wrong. Well, then why are you telling me I'm wrong? Uh, don't force your moral position on me. Is that your moral position? Yes. Well, then why are you forcing that on me? It's exposing that the claim is self-defeating. Now, uh, what about something even like a category fallacy? I Sometimes atheists like to ask, show me scientific evidence for God. And my response is typically, why would I want to do a silly thing like that? Now, let me explain that. Um, in a nutshell, God, if he exists, is a non-physical entity. And science is a wonderful tool, but it is limited to studying the physical natural world. So you cannot use something that by definition is limited to the physical to try and investigate the non-physical. It is a category fallacy. It's like asking me how much do you weigh and then asking you to hand me a ruler so I can find out. It's not the right tool for the assessment. Um, another great example, I think, was... Ed well, it, it goes a little bit further than that because when, when, when they, if they were to say, yeah, but the, the physical is all that exists 
to study, you say, aha, you've made a claim. Yes. Prove that claim. Furthermore, right. if they say, well, scientific knowledge is the only way we, we can ever know anything at all, and you say, aha, that's a philosophical claim. So in order for that to be true, you, you have to know things philosophically as well as scientifically, which yep. grants all the arguments for theism, <clears throat> or you just said something stupid. So take your pick. Yeah, so exactly. So so note what he's doing, even, even with that, is I'm not going to do the legwork. I'm going to be lazy and let the other person do the legwork because, again, it's their claim. But note, I'm not because, so for my apologists out there, you know, you, you can use science in support of a premise within a philosophical argument, but it is a, at its core, a philosophical argument. Usually when people ask this, and the reason I say, why would I want to do a silly thing like that? You, you hear what Jonathan just said. I'm forcing them to unpack what they mean by, or what kind of evidence they're talking about specifically when they say scientific, because we may, may be talking past each other. And I'm either going to ask a clarifying question or let them undo, do the legwork of explaining everything he just said. Well, well, the physical is all that exists. Okay, now he's just made a claim. Now I can run with that. I'm gathering information along the way. I think it was Ed Fazer who came up with the illustration. Suppose you, you, you go to a beach with your friend, and two hours later you meet back at the beach, and he comes back and he has a metal detector, and he says, hey, I just, I just discovered that there's no plastic on the beach. In fact, I don't even believe plastic exists. And you look over your friend's shoulder and you see that the beach is littered with plastic. And you say, why would you, why would you come to that conclusion? And his response is, well, because I just spent the last couple of hours using my metal detector. And I found a lot of metal, but it never detected plastic. Of course, the problem with that is that, well, of course, it wouldn't detect plastic because you have a, a metal detector, not a plastic detector. The problem is he's using the wrong tool to investigate something that the tool is not meant to use. So uh, same thing in that, you know, when you're pointing out these logical fallacies, you're able to kind of give that quick and easy rebuttal to kind of show, hey, I know you think you're right, and I'm attacking your justification to show you you haven't actually proven that you're right, so let's, let's reassess this. And in doing this, rather than offering responses or refutations, you're forcing the other person to think about the, the e alleged evidence they're standing on to reject the God that you and I worship. Amen. Wow, that's awesome. Well, one of the things that, that always... Uh, can trip people up is when you get into worldview conversations and we'll just use atheists because uh, we can't help ourselves. That seems to be all that we want to talk about. So when an atheist, atheists, when it comes to this burden of proof and asking, they, they want to put you to, as the question answer rather than the asker, mm. you can just be there saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I believe, I believe in Jesus. You made a claim, <laughs> right? They're like, Prove your God exists, like Peter Nicholson's out in our chat. You know, I, I I said I was a Christian, right? <clears throat> I didn't make an argument. <laughs> I, I didn't make an argument. So so but I say, do uh, you want to talk about that? So you're not a Christian. Then you start asking questions, but don't let them just dump a burden of proof when you never made a claim. So it, 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 you say, are, are you're not one? I guess. Why are you not one? And then you make them defend themselves. I mean, you know. Just yeah. saying. Helpful, helpful. Yeah, content. because people are always trying to put the other person on, on the defensive because it is the easy route. And Christians need to go easy on themselves. And I, and I like what you said when you brought up the problem of evil example, which is like, are, you know, well, God exists. God is God of love and there's evil. Yes, go on. Um, what about it? The, you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm, you know what, where I'm going with it. No, I really don't don't assume that you have to not only do their work, but then steal man for them the best version that they can't even articulate themselves. Apologists need to stop doing this work. It's not it's not gracious or charity. You respond to what they say. You don't have to do their work for them. Yeah, yeah, and and there's you know other stuff to go into that that are not on my slides. But I mean, when you even look at scripture, I mean the, the Proverbs uh, twenty six four and five uh, talks about. Don't answer a fool according to his folly. And the very next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly. Which is what I love to do. That's my life verse. And and, and when you look at it, it's not a contradiction because you look at the reasons being given. And uh, and we're done with the slides. There's nothing after that. Um, so first it says, do not answer a fool according to his folly. And it says, least you be like him. And then the other one says, answer a fool according to his folly. Least he thinks he's right. So here's the Eric James translation is don't... The EJV? Engage, yes, the EJV is, is don't engage in fallacious reasoning or else you'll be just like the person that you're talking to. And the second one is to respond and correct or point out to the fallacious reasoning. 
and it literally says, or else he'll think he's right. So, so for example, if I said I'm the smartest person in the world, and you ask me, to, <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and you ask me to prove it, and I give you a book and says, with well, look, me sitting right here, yes, yeah, I look, mean, you know, come on. And, and I and I give you a book and I say, well, look, this book says Eric Hernandez is the smartest person in the world. And then you ask me, well, who wrote the book? And I say, well, well, I did. I wrote the book. Obviously, that's that's circular. It's fallacious. Now, what if, though, someone said, why are you a Christian? And you say, well, because the Bible says so. And they say, oh, who wrote the Bible? Well, God did. It's still fallacious and circular. Throwing the word God or Bible or theological terms doesn't make it not fallacious. So what Scripture is saying is do not engage in fallacious reasoning like the fool, least you be like him. And the next one is to correct and point out the fallacious reasoning, least he thinks he's right. This is, it, it, to translate it again, it's, these are offering rebuttals and pointing out correcting these false ideologies, these strongholds. And this is precisely what the Bible commands us, which is what we've labeled it, it, in New Testament terms as the task of apologetics. It's something biblical. And if you're not engaging in apologetics, you are being uh, rebellious against the commandments that God has given us in the New Testament. Yeah, and what's interesting is those two verses are like some of the common ones that people say, the Bible contradicts itself. And they'll go to that. And I'm like, it says, answer a fool and don't answer a fool. Well, let, let's look at it. Number one, they're not contradictory. Number two, they're in what we call wisdom literature. And reading the whole corpus of wisdom literature will make you wiser so that you know when it is appropriate to answer a fool according to his folly, as verse 5 says, or when not to answer a fool according to his folly, as verse 4 says. So, different situations call for different things. And you can actually do both within the same conversation, typically. So I'm going to do something here. I'm going to bring Eric's mic. I'm going to angle it a little better. Maybe it'll pick us both up since this one's not doing so great. But, um, okay, hopefully you guys can hear me now. Uh, we have was, a super chat from Gregory Fisher. Uh, yeah, let's go to some, let's go to some chat. Let's go to and, some questions. Yeah, I, have, I actually have a list here. Okay. So uh, Gregory Fisher here says, um, face. from Tulsa, okay, you guys are the real deal for sure. Thank you so much, Gregory. Thank we love, we you, love Gregory. Greg. Thank you, Greg. Gregory. Um, Derek wants to know, can Eric create an argument for why Taco Bell should bring back the extreme cheese and beef quesadilla? Fifteen years later, Quesa, I'm still did you not say quesadilla? Over them taking it off the menu. Have you never seen Napoleon Dynamite? Okay, and just sit there and Wait. be pop culture ignorant. Um, Fifteen years later, and I'm still not over them taking it off the menu. Yeah, so quesadilla. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, some of these things only come through prayer and fasting, and <laughs> you know, a few years ago during COVID. Uh, Taco Bell took the Mexican pizza off the menu, and it devastated me. It it, it was, I mean, end times kind of stuff, you know. And yeah, it, it was it was hard. But what did I do? I prayed, and I prayed. Salt wise counsel. Salt wise counsel. I got prayer warriors together, and praise his name, saints. They brought the Mexican pizza back about a month ago. And won't he just, do it? Won't he? D <laughs> My goodness, I'm about to have a praise break in this place. Yeah, let me tell you something, though. I'm Team Santi on this one, even though I love you, Eric. But, I mean, like... So, thanks for having us, guys. We're done here. <laughs> Show us. No true Mexican eats Taco Bell, according to, to Santi. And, I mean, you know, I always Great tease science. you. I always, I always tease you a lot because, I mean, like, you think pouring salsa on ramen noodles is Mexican <laughs> food. So, I mean, uh, naturally, you would eat Taco Bell. So... I mean, why? Yeah, so let's use the lazy approach here. <laughs> I never made the claim that it was Mexican food. So why would you assume it's Mexican food, oh. right? Knowing how to answer instead of what to answer. <laughs> On top of that, I don't consider it Mexican food because that would be a disgrace to talk about. It is manna from heaven. It is up <laughs> steps above Mexican food. So call it what you want. I love this stuff. It's it's a blessing yeah. to my soul. All right, here's, uh, here's one from uh, the other side. The best evidence for atheism is the lack of evidence for theism. Yeah, so, okay, so this was actually my PowerPoint. It's funny because atheists are predictable most of the time, and they usually <laughs> use the same argument. Yes, so they in, are. in my PowerPoint, the, the two objections the young lady gave, the first was the Bible is full of contradictions. And again, the question is, why are you an atheist? And I was talking to her. The next thing she said was, well, there's no evidence. My response was the same, and how does this prove there is no God? Here's an example. Right now, I have no evidence that there is a flea in this room, but it does not logically follow from that, that therefore there is no flea. All that follows is that I have no evidence that there is no flea, but it does not logically follow, therefore there is no flea. So you cannot make that leap, nor is that evidence for the falsification of a position. So I would just ask again, why are you an atheist? Because what you've given me so far 
is not cutting there it. There might be a Red Hot Chili Peppers album around here and Flea's the bass player, but that would be true. a category foul. So that, there you go. <laughs> yes, it would. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and we have here Jamie Russell, Hernandez, and Preach It. That's what they call Preach It. Oh, okay. 2024, Brando did it. And I have to apologize, folks, because last week, some of you said, some of you gave super chats and said for Brando, and I already forgot why for that Brando. was. For those that don't know, Brando said one day, I wish I could give Super Chats because I love these guys, but I just don't have it right now. And so everybody started funding, started giving uh, funds for, and, Brando, and his, for, Brando, for, for Brando, for Brando, for Brando. Brando. Yeah, it, See how the body of Christ just comes together? That's like right. That? And then memes have developed with like an, an army coming and Gandalf going, for Brando. Yes, I mean, it's a whole thing. Our show is the funnest apologetic show. We have lore now. Yeah. On, on yes, we have our own lore. Oh, and, and by the way, I, I it's, thank you for that. Super I show. always end up okay. Same thing with Doctor Featherstone with Chris Featherstone. How come I always end up in the seconds? Why am I always getting the? I, not that I'm complaining, but I'm always the VP in Just these complain. tickets. Like I'm, what? I'm always the, I always get the VP slot for these presidential runs with. It's either Hernandez and Preach It or... Because you've made it very clear story. that you want to be the second guy. You don't want to be the main guy. Yeah, second. I know, but they shouldn't know that. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's my secret that I don't want to try hard. I feel like it's a lot harder to be the main that's guy. That's right. I don't want any of the response. Does Eric Hernandez offer apologetic resources in Spanish? Why are you asking me? Why, why, why should... Why wouldn't you ask these guys? Why me? It's kind of racist. Now I uh, offer Eric Hernandez <laughs> <laughs> yeah. material uh, so, so, in, in English and pass it off as my own. So but I, I, yeah, personally, no, I don't. Uh, though I, I want to work on that. So I do speak Spanish, but when it comes to teaching apologetics, I'm not the most fluent, and there are certain words that are kind of difficult to translate. I would highly recommend a great friend of mine, George Gill. He has uh, apologetics material in Spanish. George Gill. He's the executive director of Cross Examine. But when the book comes out, I do I do plan on uh, working with him to get that translated. Yeah. Um, and I'll that. also add that uh, a good number of the apologetics material that Zondervan has published, they are probably the best Christian publishing house at translating their material into Spanish. So if there's a an apologetics book by Zondervan, chances are you can get it in Spanish. Thanks, Adam. We appreciate it. And uh, let's see. Rich says... This is super helpful. Is there a way to have access to this PowerPoint material? Yes, I, I pedal it on the side. I, I steal all of their stuff and can give you bootleg versions of it. So, If there is, uh, is there a way that they can get that PowerPoint? I could send it to you. Send it to we them. could maybe put a link to like a Google Drive or something of it if, if Eric's okay with that. Yeah. Actually, we could just you could just post it as a file in the Trinity Radio forum. You always say forum. It's a Facebook group. <laughs> Old. Yes. Old. Okay, Boomer. I'll, yes, old. Better shape than you. And of though. course, when the book comes out, I'll, I'll we'll do a show about it or something. Yeah. Well, how about this? We'll we'll drop the uh, the PowerPoint in the um, Trinity. Well, uh, I'll put it in the uh, put it in the Trinity Radio Facebook group. Yeah. If you're not there, it's a forum. Jonathan will be the one to let you in. So if you don't get in, it's not my fault. All right. Let's see. Uh, but it has been super helpful. Thank you, Rich. Um, I would say you're all the greatest living apologists. There could be only one. Go watch Highlander. We, we, we I will <laughs> chop their heads off to. Inspiring philosophy in the end. famously used the so what response in his own way against Dillahunty. Yeah, Dillahunty said Dillahunty's famous. Well, that doesn't convince me. He's like, I don't care. If now, he right. Me. So now, <laughs> thank and, you for that bit of autobiography a, that nobody asked for. But. There's a little insight though to that. And and you know, I'm a humble guy. I'm one of the most humble people I know. You do care that he's convinced. You know? Is that what you're so, gonna say? No, no, oh, okay. no, no, really. Not uh, you don't want to contradict <clears throat> scripture. Not not more humble than Moses. Yeah, right. Yeah. So according um, to Moses, it, it. So when before I knew IP, and I'm, I'm I'm good friends with him now. The way I got in contact with him was when he was going to be debating Dillahunty. Because as many of you know, I debated Dillahunty some years ago on the Soul. I actually reached out to Mike and said, "Hey, I've debated this guy before. Would you like you know, would you like some 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 um, help?" you know, prepping for that. And I can give you some kind of some of my notes and things I've picked up on some of his tactics. And one of the things uh, that I picked up on was he, he likes, he, he tends to pose the uh, topic of the debate as if the topic is, can so-and-so convince Matt Dillahunty of yeah. X? Well, that that's not the topic, but if you let him make it that topic, then all he has to say is I'm not convinced. So I actually was telling Mike this and I said, so Listen, when he pulls that card, don't do what most apologists do and try to reiterate the argument. Lazy approach. Um, you've already made the argument. His response, 
does not require a refutation or rebuttal. All you have to do is point out how it doesn't matter if he's convinced because that's not the topic. So I remember watching this, uh, uh, you know, having uh, helped Mike uh, inspiring philosophy prep for this. And, you know, again, this isn't secret knowledge, but it's also not something I've professed. Who cares? Let God get the glory. Um, that's why I say I'm very humble. So when that happened in the debate, yeah, exactly. Mike said, so what? I don't care if you're convinced. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, he implemented that. So, yeah, absolutely. As yeah. you can tell, oh. Eric is good at um, saying complex things simply. There's a lot of things I say that I got from Eric, and I try to give him credit when I do that. I don't always. I, I never give anyone credit when I show the stuff, you know, if it's y'all. Well, one thing is just the simple, and this is another one of those things, like you said, like, if you have watched three apologetics videos, you probably heard something like this, but it's, it's really good to be reminded. Like when someone says, well, okay, well, how does that work? You know, exp exp you believe that you have to explain how that works. No, I don't. I know my car works, but I don't know how it works. I know when I, t I mean, I basically know, but I don't know all the details when I turn on the ignition, right. that the car starts and takes me something. That's crazy. You know, I just saw someone, I think it was Ben Watkins was putting up the other day, asking the question, things that you technically understand how they exist, but they still blow your mind. And I put uh, music on physical audio on physical objects like a CD or a record. How is how is sound on a physical record? I mean, I know how, but it still blows my mind, right? Yeah, I forgot what point we were making. Well, I, I want to make a point now. Somebody's thinking, <laughs> well, wasn't. when atheists watch this video, and if we if we kind of do this kind of thing, can't they do this kind of thing too? Yes, and it's actually I'm I'm hoping that atheists will watch this kind of stuff, and here's why: because if if we're better equipped to have better conversations and they know what they're doing, they're going to adjust the blather, I will say, that comes out of their mouths because they know that we're ready for it and we're not going to sit there and respond to every little thing. And and so I hope that because I think that if we get better at this and they know what we're doing and so they adjust, I think better conversations all around will occur. So it's not that we don't want atheists to see this kind of thing so that they know what we're up to and as far as how we're engaging them. No, we want them to know so that they will kind of adjust the way that they approach these conversations and it will overall produce better conversations. Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I echo that 100% because th there's times where I've done debates and, like, a lot of— I won't mention which one, but, you know, it's, it wouldn't be hard to guess. There's debates I've done where the half of the debate or my time of the debate, I'm having to explain things to the other person just because they haven't read, you know, a 101 philosophy of mind or, or you know, a philosophy book in general. Um, so, yeah, I want to have better discussions. This, this approach is not, uh, let me show you how to do a gotcha on atheists. That may happen, but that's not the goal. The goal is legitimately to... To kind of take away the fluff and get to the heart of the issue to have the sincere, genuine, substantial discussions that matter instead of spending, you know, two hours talking about this one particular passage in this book and whether or not, you know, X, Y, or Z. No, does God exist? When, one guy once told me, uh, this one atheist said, well, I don't, I'm, I don't believe in God because I don't believe in fairy tales. My response was, cool, me neither. What do you want to talk about next? You know, I, I'm not going to engage in this, this ridiculous debate. And you go, well, no, but, but you do, and blah, blah, blah. And I, and I did the same thing I did what I said earlier. Um, if God exists, could he, because he said, well, you, there's a talking serpent. Well, if God exists, could he allow a serpent to talk? Well, yeah, if he existed. Okay, great. So let's start with that question. Does God exist? And if we have time, we can maybe talk about, you know, talking serpents later. But let's get to the heart of the issue. So, yeah, I, I want them to listen to this. I'm looking forward to Pine Creek's video on this. Um, but, yeah, we, we want to have better discussions. And this is just a, a minimalist approach, if you will, a lazy approach to get to the heart of the issue and, and stop wasting time with these nonsensical stuff. Yeah. Um, OK, so I've got some uh, more questions here. First of all, your former debating partner, Danny, is here. My man. And he says, how do you reach the unreachable atheist asking for a friend? So, yeah. So Danny revealed something to me, So which which I did, just didn't put the two in together. But uh, a few years ago, Danny, we actually talked on the phone. And I, I do remember that conversation. Still have his number on my phone. Uh, so great question, Danny. That this is when, when we talk about reaching, first we want to say have better discussions because you can't reach someone if you can't even communicate well with them. So my goal a lot in a lot of these discussions is just to put a pebble in the shoe, if you will. And, and sometimes, let me be honest, <clears throat> there are some people I know I'm not going to reach. I'll just go ahead and say it. Uh, Aren't raw. Yeah, I, I doubt I would ever convince them of anything. But I know that there's people on the fence who are going to listen to that, or even people who follow him who may be on the fence, or people who look up to him 
and I don't know why, but I but after my debates with him, I've had people reach out to me and say, you know what, I I, I now see that this guy probably doesn't know what he's talking about in these areas. So you know, I think he's good on this, but not this. So I'm not going to go with him when he says this kind of ridiculous stuff about epistemology or soul or, or metaphysics. And, and even that right there to me is 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 a uh, um, uh, gradually at least getting to a better side or position. Even if you still disagree with me, at least we're, we're making progress. Now, how do you reach the unreachable atheist? It, what, of course, it depends on, a, on the atheist. And, and if I can put on my, my pastoral hat for a second, we don't save anybody. I, I've never saved anyone. The Holy Spirit does that, that work. But there are tools and ways that we are caught and commanded to, loving them and apologetics is commanded in the New Testament. But at the end of the day, it's up to the person. You know, I, I can't force someone to do anything. So at the very least, I can show that, hey, I can give a rebuttal and say, hey, this justification for your atheism doesn't work, or hey, I think you're off here. And sometimes at the end of the day, if I could just put it this way, some atheists are willing to bite the bullet, in my opinion, the most bizarre ways or senses of, well, maybe there just is no morality, or you know, you're not the same person from one to the next, or X, Y, or Z. And at that point, there's not much you can say other than, well, at least you're trying to be consistent, but I just want to make sure you understand the implications of this. And, and so let, let's, yeah, without going into much more examples, I mean, basically at the end of the day, it, it's, it's going to be a choice, just like marriage is a choice. It, you know, I didn't just, I didn't look at one thing about my wife and said, I'm going to marry her. It was a gradual accumulation of things that I said, I'm ready to drop on my knee and propose. Well, God has dropped on his knee and it's up to the atheist to whether or not they say I do. And that's not something I can force, but I can help them wrestle with their doubts or struggles or questions and allow the Holy Spirit, of course, to do to do the work He does, and I do the work that I'm called and commanded yeah. by the Bible to do. And and bringing up Aaron Raw, for example, someone that you think you're never going to reach, and that it's really for the sake of the audience to have the, the debate. But one thing that, that we need to make clear is that when you're engaging in these kind of conversations, you're not the, the what we don't want you to do is debate and get bogged down in de de defending all of these. Uh, the other three things in the triage as opposed to the main thing, which is the resurrection as opposed to the other issues that they may want to drag uh, the conversation into. Because the point is to not debate. The point is to yeah. have a conversation and try to to help. See, what's interesting to me is atheists want to... I, I'm always looking for the aim uh, of the atheist because Christians, I mean, we naturally... What we want is we want you to... Uh, Repent, believe the gospel, and have everlasting life, and spend it with Jesus and all of us. We want you forever to be our friend and brother in the Lord. What do you want? <laughs> you know what? What are you after? Because it it it, it typically it comes. It could be that it's something they're just interested in. It could be um, they they see religion as creating a political situation they don't like. Right. But um, I, I, yeah, I agree. And I think it's important to ask those kind of questions too, because I think motives matter. And, yeah. and so if there are a lot of Christians who get into apologetics and they think that what Eric is saying here is trash, because what they want to do is they want the atheist to put them on the defensive. They vomit up whatever apologist book they recently read. Right. And, and atheists are out there the same thing. They're ax grinders who want to spend their time arguing for amusement right there that that happens on both sides but there's no purpose in that other than selfish reasons right yeah so yeah. avoid debates and just engage and ask questions so that we yeah. can we Good can thoughts. see people come to Christ. and look at this bridget read that for us wow we very very much appreciate oh this my gosh, that's crazy that's fifty dollars thank you guys spirit and due to inflation <laughs> I want to help you treat you guys to dinner, Taco Bell in parentheses, and that's what it requires now to eat out, even at Taco <laughs> yeah, Bell. Dude, the, if, well, that's the gas to get to the restaurant. <laughs> to no. Yeah, all told. it's. Thank you so much. In fact, we do appreciate all the super chats of any amount because they go to continue to improve things around here. Um, probably the next thing we need is to make sure that we can get a third mic that's actually <laughs> works well. But Well, this isn't, yeah. this doesn't happen. I know it's especially this is special because we have a special apologist, here. right? But we also have a special donation here of fifty dollars, <laughs> which is which I appreciate more than Eric's visit. Thank so, you so much. I, I do appreciate that, Medio Ninus. You have always been good to us, Mateo Ninus. Mateo, Medio. Mateo. <laughs> what? Mateo. 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 Medio Ninus. I, I I want to. 
I want to believe that is a legitimate picture and want to believe that the mustache is real. Yeah, well, along the similar line, what just believe. happened to the screen? What just happened to part of my, b- this black box I have up here? Dang, coming. They're going to take back their donations. Yeah. Don't take back. Don't take take it back. There we go. Okay. But now we have Medio Ninus back up there. Mateo, Mateo Ninus. <laughs> here we go. Medio, you see? See, Denise, this is, this is, this is truly maybe... I C Denise has been all of our pictures have been good to us. Yeah. C Denise has gone the extra mile. way above and beyond. Yes, and uh, so powerful in my life what you've done to make this possible. Yeah, Rex, any plans to get back out there with the evangelistic apologetic event? So we have already done um, a couple of apologetic evangelistic events this year already. Um, they are fewer since COVID. I have to say that, but uh, um, we have. Okay, let me say this. There is an event. You don't even know, Jonathan. You don't even know. Right. There is an event coming up starring John McRae, Inspiring Philosophy, me and maybe you. I don't know yet. Okay, maybe me? Yeah. Okay. Well, I just realized halfway through that that, that I did, well, am not sure whether you're involved in it or not. And if I don't, and, and you're going to be upset. You're not even going to care. If you're not going to be involved. Right. Yeah. I mean, if, if, well, if you were going to pay for the gas and stuff, and I you could go have gone, but not. Out. Right. But um, here's, well, the, the, super chat CD here's the thing. We would have more events because I can't speak for um, Eric Hernandez, but Braxton Hunter and I would have more events because remember that one or both of us will come for just expenses and any love offering that you have to offer. We will go anywhere. Yeah. I, you know, doesn't we, we don't we don't have to 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 go to just the big venues. Um, we like small local churches, so uh, pay our expenses um, is all that we ask, and then uh, a love offering, and we're we're there. Um, okay, I do want to get back to Derek. Uh, Derek gave a super chat here and says from Derek. Got, read it, Bridget. My mic's back. From Derek Beeler. See. I, I don't have to act like I don't know how to say his name. Beeler says, gotta run, boys. Super chat because I love this triumvirate of great minds. And for Brando. For Brando. For Brando. Okay, Eric, here's a serious... Well, let's do an atheist one first. So instead of advising someone to use a script, why not have an actual conversation instead of replying with all that empty rhetoric? Yeah, so... Call it what you want. The empty rhetoric is to have a better conversation because most of the time in the examples I gave, there was nothing but rhetoric. So the irony of what you're saying is I'm responding in that way to point out how the other person is merely giving me rhetoric and they are not further in the conversation. So that's the point of having an actual conversation. If, if you say something like, well, uh, the grass is green, so the sky shouldn't be blue, I'm going to say go on or tell me why because that is what makes for a productive conversation when you actually unpack things instead of just throw out empty slogans that everyone's heard that you, know, that you get from you know, godisdumb.com that are not arguments but mere <laughs> assertions. And I want to have a discussion, not just allow you to just throw out and, and change your, your slogan every time I, I give a response. So, yeah, I'm going to just do the lazy work and say go on or unpack that and ask you to actually give me some substantial uh, argument. And, and I would like to just say, with with all due respect, Casey, Randy, but this is just mere empty rhetoric because had you paid attention to anything that Eric had been saying, including where he discussed uh, fallacies and mentioned the categorical fallacy, uh, making a category error, uh, he has not advised anyone to use a script because no script has been presented. This is tactics, so you're you're confusing those items. Oh, yeah, so I literally sure. said, I, I thought I thought he conceded that. No, yeah, I literally yeah. said this is not a script. Like, I even said I don't like it when these evangelistic manuals come out as some kind of script, like, hey, go in the back of the book, and, you know, when you're talking to someone, if they give this objection, oh, that's objection number six, let me turn to that page and read you the answer. No, that's, that's not how conversations work. Yeah, so speaking of empty rhetoric, that counts. Next. Jamie Russell says, are you a soul or do you have one at Eric Hernandez? So <clears throat> I, I am a soul. Technically speaking, I am a soul. I don't, quote, have a soul. I am a soul that has a body. But here's where I do have to be honest because a few years ago I changed my position on this. Uh, I actually do believe I have a soul now because uh, a few years ago 
uh, I went to the dealership and I bought a Kia Soul and it's orange. So I do now believe I have a Kia Soul and there's an empirical evidence that I have it. It's, it's sitting in my garage. And you invited me to come inside your soul and live yes. in your soul That's for right. a period of time. Yes. Yeah. I've had these guys in my soul. So I am and a JP soul. Moreland. You've had JP Moreland. I've had the You've had Frank Turek in your soul. Frank Turek, Greg Coco, Moreland, Jay Warner Wallace. Yeah, we need, we're going to have to. Wait yeah. and flowers. I, I am genuinely curious about this though, even though it was directed to Eric. Direct that to Braxton. How will you answer that question? Are you a soul or do you have a soul? Yeah. So here's the thing. I don't disagree with what Eric has said. It's just that my, the, the thing with me is I think that, okay, so here's the thing. During the, interme during the intermediate state, obviously, right? Like if you go to Luke chapter 16 and you see Jesus talking about the rich man of Lazarus, and it seems like there's an intermediate state there that he's talking about in one place is hellish. In one place is heavenly in Abraham's bosom and that whole thing. But that's not the end game after the resurrection when we will, uh, body and soul, our bodies will be raised, glorified, and we will, um, we will be glorified and we will live forever as an embodied soul, mm -hmm. right? So while um, because I believe, because I am a dualist and I believe in the intermediate state, I, I agree 100% with Eric. And I think it's certainly true that we will live without a body as a soul. Um, in the intermediate state. However, in the end, I think what God ultimately wants for his creation, for his anthropology, is embodied souls for God's reasons. And we have shows where we've talked about the reasons for that. So I think that ultimately, to, it may be true that if you peel away all that's necessary, one can survive as a soul. And, and so in that sense, yes, you're a soul that can have a body. I think that what God wants for you is to be an embodied soul. Yeah, so the, yeah, I would agree with that. The way I'd put it is, um, so because because so when I when I when we're talking about this stuff, I just kind of the way I like to think about it, the way I do think about it, and maybe this is just a byproduct of my ADHD. It's just like, hey, is this yes or no? Is this the case? It is. Now, some people are like, oh, you know, how, so one guy said, okay, if you're gonna say that you are a soul and that a body's not necessary for you to be what you are, then how do you avoid Gnosticism? And my response is, well, by not going to Gnosticism, that's why I avoid it. Yeah, I mean, in other words, it's not a slippery slope. You're not saying that who's asking the question. I say all that to say, in other words, you are a soul that has a body. Now, what are the implications? Well, simply just that. I mean, there, there, it's, it's, there's an intermediate state. However, that's not to say, what I'm not saying is that you don't need a body or that, you know, it's irrelevant. That, that may go into Gnosticism. I do think and would say that the most natural state of a soul is to be embodied. Um, and, and, and I mean, if someone wants to say, you know, I have a soul, I mean, I'm not going to be nitpicky much about that. I, I get what they mean, but, and that's why I say, technically speaking, I am a soul. So it just helps make that distinction that at my core, I, I am a soul. And how do I know that? Well, because I'll live in a state of disembodiment prior to the final resurrection, which shows that's not necessary for me to be what I am. Although again, the most natural state for a soul to exist is embodied. Does anyone want to know my, oh, sure. Go ahead. The answer to the question is yes. Um, baby lemon looking up to our lemon character standing in a superhero position. This is a picture. It's this one right here in the super ah. chat. But this software doesn't show the picture. <laughs> it just describes it. And we love that here. Wow. So anyway, thank you for that super chat. Um, I appreciate that super sticker. Meow, 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 meow had a question. Meow, meow, meow yeah. says can't afford a super. Well, that's where you say for Brando. Uh, or you, no, no, no. I'll get, no, yeah, you can say for Brando or for Meow right now. Yeah. Um, can't yeah and by the way, we, we can't, answer questions that, that without that, super chat. Yeah, of course. And, and but they know how testy yeah. you get about that. No, I, I, no, I'm not testy about. It. I just want to make sure we address those first. I see. Can Eric? Please I show comment? favoritism because I haven't read the Book of James in a while. Can Eric please <laughs> comment on my prior question about Baldy's case for postmodern postmodern? Post post Postmortem survival. I port, let's see, postpartum survival? No, postmortem survival. And not postmodernism either. I worry my comment was buried under spam. Sorry if I have sent to me. You haven't. You haven't. You feel free to, if we, hey, if we miss your comment, you send it again. And if after you send it three or four times we don't, we probably just didn't want to answer it. So, uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with, with his Don't case give away that. that so ma maybe you can send another comment explaining it briefly or something, and I can respond to yeah, it. Yeah, we will try to catch it. But I'm not familiar with it. Sorry. See, Eric's not a big book reader. I just make stuff up. He just makes it up. He just um, repeats what I tell him. Israel says... Israel. Were you guys aware that Aaron Ra came out as a Satanist? 
By the way, Pritchett is underrated, LOL. I'm not underrated. I'm rated exactly where I That's should be. That's your stand, though. Or the guy that says you're the stand. Or however that works. He's your fan. Is it Israel your fan? You want to stand? Yeah. Someone said I'm Pritchett stand. Yeah. Pritchett stand. No, that that's at, at our conference. Yeah, Cuomo, Israel went. But... Israel came to our uh, an apologetics conference in December. Oh, that's right. And he said that Pritchett was his. Uh, yeah. He and he's Pritchett. one of my favorite human beings to appreciate the importance. And a Calvinist. Of I think. Yes. Uh, we love Calvinists. Yeah. I'm just. I'm, I'm highlighting. The I just fact. like to make them look stupid on occasion. I'm highlighting the fact that one of your favorite people is a Calvinist. Yes. We All love right, Calvinists. Thank you for that super chat, Israel. Um, Derek. I did not. Has Y'all are just going to sell that by? What do you think about him coming out of... Uh, what What I'm curious is... Wait, what? I guess he is the kind of... Sat- like, oh, yeah, we didn't the, talk about his the Satan, <laughs> The Satanists that, that are like, we're for free thought and Satan's Wait, he really, symbol he really came whatever. out of the Satanists? Or is Look, he... There's uh, two types of Satanists. Yeah. I teach a class on cults where we cover this. Yeah. There's uh, the, the naturalistic, or the, at least the atheistic Satanism, where it's not really... They don't really believe in an ontological Satan. They're just atheists and... Uh, and they they ha- they go by the, the set of principles that go under the moniker of Satanism. But then there is theistic Satanist Satanism, and my understanding is there's less than fifty thousand theistic <clears throat> Satanists. I don't know who's counting, but uh, there's only about fifty. There's not many theistic Satanists. I am strongly confident that Aaron Ra is in the non-theistic Satanist. Well, well, here's my response: is that even the demons believe and tremble. So. <laughs> Well, Eric, but here's the real question. Have you done any interaction with Edward's freedom of the will as a libertarian? Or Jonathan, do you want to comment on that? I don't care. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not from, I don't think I'm familiar. Yeah, we're talking, about, just, we're just talking think, about Jonathan Edwards. What is, what, yeah, Jonathan Edwards, it's, yes, he has interacted, we, not directly with, not with, not, yeah, it's not long. But not directly with Edwards, but you have dealt with what I think amounts to, and not just me, I think Kenneth Keatley accepts this. What amounts to theological fatalism? There are, uh, there are issues that even I mean, A. A. Hodge called Edwards uh, a pantheist, right? Uh, he's a systematic theologian. I mean, Edwards. Uh, a lot of people. Was it Muller is trying to move? Came out with a book of other ways besides the Ed, uh, the Edwards. Is trying to. It, it sounds like it's compatibilist, but what it ultimately results and collapses into is fatalism. So I'm sure you've encountered that type of thing. To which Mueller came out with a book not too long ago, about a year or two ago, maybe longer now. I've lost track of time since 2020, but um, trying to show other reformed ways of, of speaking about it, independent of that Edwards type formula. So because I th- I think it does amount to it's it's a hard determinism at best, fa- theological fatalism at worst. So I would say that Eric okay, probably here's, has. Okay, here's some more from Meow Meow, giving us more info. Steve, read it, Pritchett. Stephen, was it Broad? I don't know how to say the name. 2003 book, Immortal Remains, makes a case for afterlife from disturbing areas of research. More since then, but his book is worthy of study. His critics are unfair, in my opinion. Now... Uh, disturbing areas of research. I'm not, I, I'd have to know what those are, and I'm yeah. sure Eric would too. So maybe it was something we could look into. If the book yeah. is under 50 pages, I'm sure Eric could read it in Often six times or seven weeks. Oftentimes, audio recommend book. things that I go check out later. So I appreciate you doing it. Yeah. That. All right. Um, let's, let's get to some of the favorite questions here. Okay. So we got Eric, we talked about that. Um, Braxton is the white Adam Coleman. Proud True. to be. Yes. Um, it's a weird emoji, isn't it? It's like okay, I, I, the bald white. <laughs> what is that emoji? Adam it's supposed Coleman. to be like a fist, but oh, it's yeah. it's like the I feel like that's on. some kind of Illuminati thing. Maybe that's something he's letting me know. It's about. Raised fist, guys. It's supposed to be, but it looks more like this. But right? but yeah, uh, the white without hair. Uh, Faithiest atheist. Okay. And by the way, hey, I apologized to him for not reading one of his super chats two weeks ago, mm-hmm. and said that then on the next episode I would read it first, and I didn't. So please, you're forgive horrible. Me. Please Christian. super chat please next week me. so he can. <laughs> is that what you're saying? Super chat twenty dollars next week so that we can get no, it right. I'm just saying I'm sorry. Keep giving more money, Richard. That's I mean, what he's saying. I, mean, I won't give back, but I do appreciate. <laughs> it. Take the devil's money and use it for the glory of God. Right. I refuse to believe your Kia Soul exists until you drive me around Texas. Now look, this is a careful for what you wish for. I mean, like sitting in a Kia with Eric who eats Taco Bell. You sure about that? Well, so here's the thing. So this is honestly one of my, if not my favorite atheists, is Richard. Yes. Uh, the faith is atheist. And he actually has been in my QSL. 
I have. Oh, I have, really? Yes, he had. So he came to our conference uh, in January, and and he's like, "Hey, I can get there, but you know the the airport's. Uh, I'm landing here." Um, and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm driving there from here. And he's like, Hey, will you mind if I carpool? I'm like, yeah, sure. Now the funny thing was I was actually picking up Greg Kokel from the airport and I was like, should I ask Greg Kokel or should I just tell Richard? Yeah, you can join us. And then later on say, Oh, by the way, there's an atheist in the car. <laughs> <clears throat> I did the latter. Uh, but no, he, it was great. He loved it. And I mean, this dude was so awesome and he, he came and he's, he's such a humble guy. He's like, Hey, you know, can I ride with you? But if you don't want me to hang out with you guys, I understand. I'm like, dude, yeah, we love atheists. Of course, hang out with us. I mean, I insist, you know, and yeah, he joined yeah, us for lunch, for gas. Hung, out, hung out with us and everything. So that was awesome. And he was in my soul. So th there's an atheist out there, Richard, who can show you that there is empirical evidence of my soul. And there's a picture of it. All right. Uh, Jamie Russell, who's a channel member says, I am not my body. Premise one, premise two, only bodies die. <laughs> Conclusion. I believe the snake critique. I'm not sure about, I believe the snake. Yeah. I, I think he's trying to support you one way or the other. So it's talking about the garden. Probably. Well, I, I, but what yeah, is but he saying the, exactly? I believe the snake is in. You'll surely die. The day you, uh, the day you eat there, you'll, you'll surely die. And, and his body. Ultimately so are, I, I think he's saying, therefore I am. No, he's talking body. about the well of souls from Raiders of the Lost Ark. He is. No. I'm just saying, you have, we have no idea. <laughs> I think it's just, it just is like, we're like, we're like bringing in all this stuff from Genesis and all this stuff. It's like, it could be, I think he was talking about, could that. be that serpent that raised his head and you can see his reflection in the glass protecting Harrison Ford. To say. <laughs> yeah. uh, notice how all the countless gods are different and unique in their own ways, but the same in most, in the most suspicious ways. Yeah. For I, one, I, they all seem to need human beings to do the talking and here we are. Yeah, so I would do a, a, use one of those two questions I presented earlier. It's like, what do you mean by that? Or how'd you come to that conclusion? Because cause I've had someone ask you something similar, which I think is either you're all getting it from the same website or maybe just think the same. I don't know. But in other words, who says that God needs human beings to do the talking? Says who? The talking for what? I, I mean, there's just, there's well, just so much Well, in fairness, he this. did say they all seem to need. Yeah, no, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, it's the same principle, even with that caveat. I mean, it's, says who and seems to need us to talk about what or for what. I mean, I think at Romans one twenty, it's evident in creation. Um, now, it might take some explaining from someone because they, you know, there's various reasons spiritually in all this, but this isn't an objection. This isn't an argument. I don't even know. I, I would say go on. You know, like, what's your point? Therefore, what? Yeah, mine's, so what, God has people for that? I, I was going to ask you to say yeah. your thing about that. Yeah. But yeah. another thing to point out is, um, and I'm speaking loudly, Eric, because you know why. But um, um, when we're talking about God, go back and listen to my discussion with Jonathan McClatchy from last week and find out why the only, like the, the religions that are trying to do evidential stuff like this um, in in, when we're talking about large world religions, you're talking about the three Abrahamic religions primarily. And of those, um, we can, I think it's relatively simple to make a case for Christianity. I liked what McClatchy said last week, which was, it, you know, because it, it's kind of like how atheists will com um, commonly ask, well, why do we have to be a PhD and read all these books and all this to finally be able to conclude that there's a guy? You don't. It's just that this gets really complicated because criticisms come, and the more esoteric or more complex the criticisms are, obviously, the more complex the uh, responses are also but that doesn't mean it's yeah. not obvious. We don't think it's obvious uh, that one could just look at nature and conclude as most people throughout. I hate to get all princes bright on everybody, but, but it's true. That the grandpa said when I was your age, TV was called books. You know, people actually used to read books written, you know, and there was a lot less books, but you know, the great books of the Western world, everyone lay persons, everyone read Plato and Aristotle, right? And Freud and William James and the founding fathers, even, you know, everyone read all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that Are you saying people were just better thinkers before better readers. Or so when they say, why do I have to read all of this, this hype? No, I mean, just read a book. Well, you don't even have to. quit binge watching nonsense. You don't, for have to. you don't have to read the great books. You don't have to do any of that. Yeah. But I'm just saying when they you whine about reading books, trees. I want to stop them right look there. Look at the and, trees. Yeah. But, but when they're whining about books, I want to stop them and say, nobody was whining. Go, no, you, you're, <laughs> your fictitious 
person, why do I have to read all these yeah, books? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go read books and quit watching television and you'll learn stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, but, you know. What, well, what? I'll tell you what. Uh, have we got through everything? I think we've pretty well gotten through. Am I missing anything? Folks, I want to tell you. Well, somebody else close this out. I, well, I love you all, but you can't hear me very well. I just want to say that God actually did a lot of talking for himself. Jesus, the incarnate God, did a lot of talking for himself. <laughs> This seems to be a complaint that God hasn't talked to me personally. And to that complaint, I say, so what? Anyway, and I'm, and I'm sorry that God hasn't spoken to you personally, but that's a different thing than God speaking, because he has spoken. And if you want to know what God thinks about things, he has uh, communicated his thoughts in 66 books of the Bible. Go check that book out. Instead of just to argue with it and say, ah, I can't believe that, try to learn something. The Bible's good. And if you want to learn formally about the Bible, you can always sign up for classes at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary at trinitysim.edu. If you want to learn informally, you can go to braxtonhunter.com and read all kinds of cool blog articles about hypocrites at Walmart. We thank you for watching. And you can subscribe watching. to Eric Hernandez. Yeah, I was getting to that. Anyway. It's better when I say it so it doesn't look like shameless self-promotion. Go to the link in the description for Eric Hernandez's uh, YouTube channel. He has a website as well. They say, because I don't know it, say the name of your... EricHernandezMinistries.com? Yeah, because I'm not very creative. Right. It's like BraxtonHunter.com. And, of course, there's also... You can follow them on Twitter. Uh, shout out to Twitter. Eric Hernandez... At Eric Hernandez... Min? EHM Apologetics or something like that. Yeah, he's... E yeah, EHM Apologetics or EHM Ministries. Something. Oh, yeah, something. You don't even something. know what your no, Twitter it's is. something. Yeah, it's something. So you can follow Braxton Hunter on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter, even though I never tweet anything. Friends list Twitter's stupid. Name. And we thank you so much for watching. <clears throat> Go join the Trinity Radio Primetime Discussion Facebook group forum on uh, Facebook. And we thank you for watching the video. We'll see you in the next one, everybody. God bless.